Hey everybody, I'm Catherine Caldwell Etchison. I just recently got married and I'm getting used to having a new last name, so bear with me as I kind of transition into that. Um, I'm really excited to be here to talk to you guys about bats today, especially as Halloween is only one week away. That's pretty good timing. So we'll start with just the basics about bats today to make sure we're all on the same page. Then we'll move into white nose syndrome and some of the monitoring efforts that we've got going on. And then we'll finish up with how we can all help bats. All right, so first things first, we've got to address some of those myths that we've all heard in our lifetimes. And it creates a lot of misunderstanding and confusion about what's true and what's false about bats. So we're going to tackle some of the most popular ones to start off this talk. OK, we've all heard that phrase, blind as a bat, right? So what's the deal? Are, are bats blind? Or are they not? Well. They're not. They can see just as well as we can see, but they do rely more on their sense of echolocation than they do on their vision. And this makes a lot of sense if you think about it, because bats are nocturnal, and we think about how well our own vision operates in complete darkness. Not so great. Um, so that's why bats have developed that sense of echolocation. It gives them a lot more information about their surroundings than their vision does. Okay, here's another one I hear pretty frequently. All bats have rabies. I tell people I work with bats and they say, oh my gosh, but aren't you concerned because all bats have rabies? Well, no, that's not the case. They don't all have rabies. They can carry rabies, but in North Carolina, it's only about 3% of the bats that are tested that come up positive for rabies. And I emphasize the word tested because they were already behaving pretty strangely to be tested in the first place. So they estimate that it's less than 1% of all wild bats that actually have rabies. So pretty low. Um, we treat rabies very seriously, but at the same time, we want people to understand the facts. Bats get tangled in your hair. I don't know, have you guys heard this one? I, this one kind of comes up quite a bit as well. And people will tell me stories about a time where um, a bat was swooping in close to them and they think that that bat was trying to make a nest in their hair. Uh, <laughs> this one is just totally false. Bats don't make nests and they don't want to be in your hair. I think uh, the confusion here, what, what happens when we're outside at night, there might be a lot of, of insects swarming around you, right? You're swatting at mosquitoes. But uh, the bats are just hunting those insects. They eat, them, they eat those insects, and so they may get close to your head when they're going after a bug, but they are not trying to be in your hair. And you take it from me, I spend my whole summer setting up big nets to catch bats. I go to great lengths, a lot of time and effort to catch bats for our surveys that we do. And if all I had to do was tease up my hair and make it as big as possible and stand outside, I would do that. But that doesn't work. So. One's false. Uh, the final one here for today is that bats are mice with wings. A lot of people really think that bats are just another uh, a mouse or a rodent that just has evolved wings. Um, and this is not true either. Bats are not mice and they're not rodents. They're not even very closely related to rodents. They're actually more closely related to primates than they are to rodents. They tend to be long lived. They can live upwards of 30 years and they tend to have pretty low reproductive output with only one to two pups a year. So not a mouse, even though they kind of look a little mousy to, to some people. So now that we've kind of cleaned that slate, um, we're going to build on your knowledge of bats a little bit. So bats, you guys probably know this, but they're the only flying mammal. And I think it's worth reiterating if you do already know that, because it makes them really unique and really special. And they have a lot of really cool adaptations that help them fly. So they're not a bird. They are a mammal. And they're the, our only flying one. Some people will say, what about flying squirrels? Well, that's kind of a misnomer. They more so glide from a, a higher point down to a lower point. They don't achieve sustained flight like our bats do. So bats are the only ones. They are the second largest group of mammals. And I think that's kind of surprising to some people because maybe you don't think that much about bats or you don't see them very often. But bats actually make up 20% of all mammals. So they're a pretty large group. There are a lot of bats out there. In fact, there are over 1,300 species worldwide. Now, here in the US, you know, we don't have a ton of bats, but we do have 47 species. And in North Carolina specifically, we have 17. So not too shabby. And what is so spooky about bats? 
bats. We have spooky in the title of today's presentation. Uh, how bats have become the kind of um, mascot for Halloween. So what's so scary? What are we so scared about with bats? Well, um, spoiler alert, bats are really not scary. We have made them out to be these kind of like creepy creatures. We've made them out to be scary and we talk about them a lot at Halloween, but they're actually really not scary. And it really does kind of more harm than good for bats to make them out to be these scary little creatures. Um, here in North Carolina, all of our bats are insectivorous. You don't have to worry about vampire bats. They exist in Central and South America. And there are only three species. Remember we said there are 13 hundred worldwide. So only three of those are vampire bats. You don't have to worry about those. And most of our bats look like this one. This is a tricolored bat. I'm holding that bat between my thumb and my forefinger. That's how small that bat is. This is a tiny bat. So again, don't be scared of these guys. Really the spookiest or scariest thing about bats is the threats that they're currently facing and the population declines that we're seeing as a result of those threats leads me into talking about white nose syndrome, which is the largest threat to North American bats, the largest threat that's currently going on with our bats. It is a fungal disease that's native to Europe and Asia. It's caused by this fungus called Pseudogymnoascus destructans, or just PD for short. And it was discovered in New York in 2006. Now, that may seem kind of strange because I just said it was native to Europe and Asia, but it's discovered in New York. Well, it doesn't cause the same effects on bats overseas as it does here. Um, so no one knew about it until it first showed up in 2006 and started causing that white fungal growth that we see in that photo there. It's currently in a total of 33 states and five Canadian provinces. And unfortunately, that number keeps climbing up every winter as white nose continues to spread into more, more states. It first got into our state back in 2011. It causes a mass mortality of cave hibernating bats. So not all of our bats hibernate. And of those that do, this disease does not affect every single one of them. It only affects uh, a few of them. We're not really sure why that is, why some cave hibernators are affected and some aren't. Uh, there's a lot of research going on to try to try to figure that out. But basically, how this works, this fungus, PD, it grows in cool and humid conditions like that of a cave or mine. And when bats are hibernating, they bring their body temperatures down to within one degree of that ambient temperature. So their bodies get very cold and that allows this fungus to be able to grow on them. Now, if they weren't hibernating, the fungus actually couldn't grow on them. So it's the hibernation part. That's the key here. And those bats spend, you know, all winter in hibernation. They've saved up just enough fat reserves to last them through the winter. And what happens is they sense this fungus growing on them and they wake up and they clean themselves off. And if they could do that indefinitely with no consequences, then they would be fine. But the problem is every time they wake up, they're burning fat reserves. And eventually they just burn through all their fat reserves and totally de deplete them. And then they just starve to death before winter is over. So so that's kind of the most common way that we see mortality with this disease. Another way is that um, the fungus itself can just penetrate into the bat's tissues and disrupt physiological function and just kill them outright. So it's a really nasty disease and bats are the only host that we currently know of. And it currently affects 11 different bat species and we have eight of those in North Carolina. So here's just a map of where we know white nose is currently at. So there on the left hand side, that's just a map of North America and every place that we have found white nose or the fungus that causes it. And then on the right there, that's where we've got um, white nose or the fungus that causes the disease in North Carolina. And we really see the effects of white nose throughout all of the mountains, even those counties that aren't highlighted on this map. And we've now seen it creeping into the Piedmont, into Stokes and Stanley counties. Doo, doo, doo. Come on. Oh, there we go. Um, so who are those bats that are susceptible to white nose syndrome? We said there are eight of them in North Carolina. So 
these top four are the ones that are most susceptible to the disease. They're the ones we've seen the largest population of clients from. So we'll briefly touch on each one. We've got the Indiana bat, and that's an endangered species. It was listed long before we knew about white nose, so they were already pretty rare. And in our state, we don't see them very often. They're pretty rare in our state. Then we have the northern long-eared bat. That's a threatened species. It was listed in 2015, so pretty recently, because of population declines from this disease. And then we have the little brown and tricolored bats. Those are both under review for listing because of population declines from white nose. They used to be very common, very abundant bats, and now, now we hardly see them. These bottom four, again, these are the ones that are not quite as susceptible as, as that top level of bats. We don't see quite as large population declines from these guys, uh, but we'll still go over them. We have the gray bat. That's, again, an endangered bat that was listed before white nose came about or came on the scene. And then we have the eastern small-footed and the southeastern bats. Those are both special concern species in our state. And then the big brown bat. That guy's not listed in any way, shape, or form, but it is susceptible to white nose syndrome, so we just want to make sure we don't forget about them. Okay, so what are we doing about this? This is a really nasty disease, total bummer. Um, what are we doing in our, in our state? Well, we have four long-term bat monitoring programs. They all originated in the mountains because that's where we first found white nose and that's where we see the, the primary effects of white nose. And so we, we do these four monitoring programs and those, are, um, those have been going on since at least 2011. Some of them have data sets um, since the early 2000s. And we're kind of expanding those out into the rest of the state to get a better idea of what's going on with our bats elsewhere as well. Today, I don't have time to talk about every single one of these, so we're just going to talk about these top two, our hibernacula surveys and NCBAMP. So we'll start with those hibernacula surveys. And a hibernaculum is just a place an animal hibernates. For bats in North Carolina, that tends to be caves and mines. So we go into caves and mines in the wintertime. We count all the bats. We record what species they were, whether they have signs of white nose syndrome. And that's a good way for us to um, develop some population trend information and to also track the spread of white nose syndrome. So I've got a few results to share with you guys today. So what we have here is just our, um, our mountain hibernacula counts from 2010 to 2018. So it's just the number of hibernating bats that were counted each year, each winter. And this is just those white nose susceptible species. So I don't know if you guys can see that from where you're at, but I'll, I'll kind of narrate. Um, back in 2010, we counted close to 6,000 bats that winter. And then the next winter in 2011, white nose syndrome was found we see a really steep decline of that line, really steep decline in our counts. And then at 2015, we see kind of a leveling off of that line between 2015 and 2018. So um, that line does not go all the way down to zero. That indicates we do have some survivors. So that's good news. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but overall, we have seen a 98% decrease in our counts of our hibernating bats. So uh, that's a that's a you know kind of a whopping s statistic there. That's a lot of a lot of bats that we don't see anymore. If we break it down by species, these are five of those white nose syndrome susceptible species that we do see hibernating in our state. We don't see all eight of them hibernating. We see primarily these five. So this is the, just the percent change from the pre-white nose syndrome hibernacula counts to now um, the most recent counts. And these are all negative changes. These are all declines. So you can see on the right-hand side, the most pronounced declines have been with the little brown bat, northern long-eared bat, and the tricolored bat. And that northern long-eared bat, it's you know down 100%. We just don't even see them anymore in any caves or mines in North Carolina. Um, then on the left-hand side, the eastern small-footed and the big brown bat, you know, those are about 50% declines. And those are actually probably overestimates for those species. They probably have not declined to that degree because they tend to hibernate in a lot of different places. They don't necessarily always hibernate in the caves and mines that we're going in. So just kind of take that statistic for those two bats with a little bit of a grain of salt. 
All right, so now we're going to move into NCBAMP, or the North Carolina Bat Acoustic Monitoring Program. So this is a vehicle-based acoustic survey that we do in the summertime. We drive a 20-mile route at 20 miles per hour with a bat detector on the roof of our vehicle, and it records bat echolocation calls. And then we can go home, and we can actually look at those calls and identify them to the species that made them. So it's a pretty quick, or it's a pretty cool monitoring tool that we use for bats. So I'll share some results with you from that program today as well. So what we have here is just a map of Western North Carolina, obviously, and it has these black little squiggly lines. There are 32 of them. Those are the driving transects that are just mapped out. And if there's a point on top of that line, that just indicates that that survey was conducted that year, and the larger and darker that point is, the more tricolored bat calls we recorded on that route that year. So all I need you to do is kind of get like a mental picture of this first year, 2011, and we'll see how this picture changes uh, with, each, with each year. So again, 2011, 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. We don't have this year's data quite ready to go. Um, so as a reminder from beginning to end, we saw a big change there, a big difference in the number of tricolored bat calls that we recorded. And this, this just goes to show you kind of across the board, if we had all four of those monitoring programs, uh, a data from all of those, you'd see the same thing across the board, really pretty big declines from those most white nose syndrome susceptible species. So. Uh, I know that's a bummer. Uh, I don't want to talk about that too much more in this presentation because a lot of what we have to talk about about bats nowadays is really negative, and I don't like to be negative, so we're going to move towards the, the positive part of the presentation because there is hope. There's hope for bats, so let's talk about that. Um, I mentioned earlier, we have some survivors, right? That, that line has not dipped all the way down to zero. So there are some bats that are hanging around. Even though we've had white nose since 2011, they, they keep continuing to survive. We don't totally understand, uh, do they have some sort of resistance or tolerance? We're not totally sure about that. Um, and could they pass that on to future generations? Maybe. We'll, we'll, we're hopeful about that. We're hopeful to see what happens with them. But for now, it's, it's positive news to see them hanging or continue to hang around. We're also hopeful uh, for bats on the coastal plain of our state. So we have populations of northern longer bats, tricolor bats, and little browns. So those are those ones that are like hardest hit in the, in the western part of the state in the mountains. The cool thing about them is they are active in the wintertime on the coastal plain. So if it's a warm day, they will be active at night and out there foraging on the landscape for insects. What's cool about that is that means they could fight off an infection by white nose syndrome if white nose ever gets to the coast. Because remember, it's that long duration of hi hibernation that really gets the bats. That's how that disease really gets them. So this is really great news for our coastal plain. So I know this whole white nose thing can be really overwhelming, and a lot of people wonder, what can I do? And they think, oh, I have to be a biologist or a bat biologist to do something for bats. And that's not true. We can all help bats, everybody in this room, everyone listening to this presentation, everyone, period, can help bats. So, um, and, and a lot of these, I think, are the most important ways to help bats. So the big one is to fight fear with bats. So I bet every one of us knows somebody who is like deathly afraid of bats. It could be a family member or a friend or whomever. Um, and a lot of times, you know, this can result in conflict between humans and bats. We don't want that, right? So we got to empower people to not be afraid of bats, to appreciate bats. Even if they don't like bats, they can maybe respect their place in the ecosystem. So I'm going to give you just a few benefits of bats that you can tell folks. In our area, bats are awesome for pest control. So there was a study done a few years ago that estimated bats save over 3.7 billion dollars per year in pesticide use for the corn industry. So that's a really good factoid you can just throw out there to somebody to try to get them on board with bats. Um, pest control is, is huge for bats in our area. Another cool thing bats do in other areas of the world is they act as pollinators. So there's a really neat conservation story I would encourage you to look up. Um, bats are actually the only pollinators of the agave plant, and there's a really neat, uh, uh, neat um, fusion between bat biologists and tequila or agave farmers that um, they, they're now producing bat-friendly tequila. So I would encourage you to look that up. It's just a really neat story. 
And bats are also helpful in medicinal purposes, not consuming bats, but there is an uh, enzyme in vampire bat saliva that is used as an anticoagulant in stroke victim, for, for medication for stroke victims. So another cool thing, they're able to make that in the lab. They don't have to use bats themselves. So what are some other ways to help bats? We could all install a bat box. So this is a great way to provide roosting habitat for bats, but also just to get the conversation started about bats. So if you put up one of these in your yard, your neighbor's going to be like, what's that thing in your yard? And you can say, hey, it's a bat box. Do you know about bats in North Carolina and white nose syndrome? And it's just a great educational tool. So I would encourage you to go to Bat Conservation International's website if you want more guidance on how to build or install a bat box. It's batcon.org. And then a final way that you can help bats is to help me help bats. So if you know of a cave or mine, particularly in the Piedmont or coastal plain portion of our state, please let me know because we are always in need of hibernacula to survey in those parts of the state. And they do exist. Um, this is proof. There on the left, that's a coastal plain cave that we survey. And on the right, that's a, um, an old underground mine in the Piedmont. So if you see something like that, please let me know. I'd be happy to get in there and look for bats. We have a lot of trouble finding places like that. So uh, with that, I would just thank you guys for your attention today. I would encourage you to take this opportunity over the next week with Halloween approaching to educate someone about bats. So thanks, guys. I'm here for questions.